okay thank you samir for joining today and uh, it's it's privilege but it's also an honor ki i have my colleague somebody whom i or college mate i would say whom i know for so long and we are talking on a formal forum where i want to introduce your work and what you have done to uh, to the field of biomedical engineering and whatever you know innovations you have done i was just looking at your profile and i just i just was gobsmacked with the number of publications and the patents you have made so far uh, something uh, something which i really want to know but we will definitely talk about your topic in detail at a later stage but uh, it's an honor to know you samir again what it takes to be a mit student and harvard professor and winner of so many awards i mean i just want to start with that and then we'll go into a little bit of your profile well first of all it's such a pleasure to speak to you sandeep uh, it's been a it's been a great pleasure to having known you for such a long time and thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me um going back to your question um i think you know just basically uh, the the pursuit of a goal right that's what it has been all these years uh, you know going back to our school when when we were both students at ict uh, we had a specific goal in how we define success and after that uh, you know we had our own uh, pursuits and what brought me to mit was really uh the desire to pursue a phd in a topic of uh, high interest to me uh at that time it was chemical engineering it still is uh but after coming to mit i realized that the definition of chemical engineering the way uh we were at least exposed to at least i was exposed to uh it's much broader than that so chemical engineering includes all aspects of societal impact including health and i was really excited about using the knowledge in chemical engineering to solve medical problems and that's what started my journey in biomedical engineering really at the interface of chemical engineering and medical problems and after finishing uh, my phd at mit i always knew deep down that i wanted to be a professor i was really inspired by my teachers uh, who uh, whose style of teaching whose style of performing research was very motivational and i wanted to do that in my professional career so after graduating i uh, from mit i got a job offer from university of california santa barbara uh, i was a faculty there for 17 years and about 3 years ago uh, moved to harvard as a professor of bioengineering and currently i'm the chair of the area of bioengineering at harvard oh yeah excellent yeah i mean i saw that so uh, uh, i mean i want to have uh, your profile in two phases uh, so the first phase which you just said the second phase as you would call it and i want to continue with my next question on that um, samir so i mean we read about people being in in the national academy of engineering right as one member right my i see you are a member of national academy of engineering national medicine academy of in medicine and now also national academy of inventors so uh, is it uh, for my, me it looks very very unique is that something very unique you see as a profile i see it or is something which you think every person who desires the path you can can achieve it how how rare is it <laughs> uh it is relatively rare um so you know i think uh, but to me you know it really comes down to uh trying to make an impact right so when you think about the work that you do and you ask yourself why are you doing that what is the end goal of the work that you are doing and then uh you sort of implement that uh in your daily activities and that's what we have done and for us what really it comes down to is that the work we do is engineering so just looking at from the engineering perspective we always ask ourselves uh what impact will it have in the field of engineering the use of the research that we do is in medicine because we are trying to deliver medicines in a better way so we always ask ourselves uh is it really going to make an impact on patient's health and patient's life 
And at the end of the day, the goal is to develop new technologies. So we had to invent. And so really it's the work that we do is at the interface of innovation, engineering and medicine. And on each front, we have always challenged ourselves to make an impact. And the recognition that you saw in terms of national academies is really a reflection of that, uh, or a reflection of asking that question uh, essentially every day and trying to be self-critical to make sure that our work does make an impact on these fields. Well, that's, that's, um, that's, I would think is very immense and intense that, you know, you want to believe that your work should make an impact on your life and others' life. I think that is the key message I get from what you have been, you have done in your life. And obviously I've seen you very closely for the last 30 years now. And I, I really uh, think that that's a great showcase of how dedication can, you know, result into so much, uh, you know, work uh, and dedicated work, I would say. So, so I've seen, I mean, as you said, you always wanted to be an academician, a professor, but entrepreneurship now, is that something which is an inbuilt thing when you do your research in the uh, United, US or the Western Hemisphere, or that's something which you feel um, is, is, a, is something which you acquire as a, as a skill? compared to when you do similar research or work back in India? Uh, just, just out of question, curiosity. It is not an inbuilt part of the academic research and it never has, historically speaking. Now, if you think about academic research, uh, you typically take on a big, bold, ambitious idea and pursue that uh, without really fear of failures and without really thinking too much about the end goal. You just pursue to gain knowledge. And when it comes to implementing that idea as a tangible product that somebody can use, the requirements are exact opposite, right? You cannot be abstract. You have to have something specific. Uh, it cannot be too complicated because then nobody wants to use it. And how do you convert these sort of complex, ambitious ideas into tangible products? Uh, that is not very obvious. And because of that, entrepreneurship and translation of ideas has never been uh, a big part of academia. But I, I feel that that was a, a gap that needed to be filled. To have the freedom and luxury to dream big and, and work on big, bold ideas is great. And that's the foundation of academia. But we owe it to the society to reduce those ideas into useful things. And that's something, you know, I, I think I sort of first learned that, you know, when we were undergraduates, you know, our alma mater, um, ICT, is a good example of that. You know, that was always stressed upon us how uh, our education needs to be of help to the actual products. Um, when we, when I started doing my PhD, I was fortunate to have an advisor who also believed in a very similar idea that translation is important. And he gave me the freedom and, and the flexibility to pursue that. So I'll give an example of my own PhD research. Uh, we developed, uh, when I started my PhD, the goal was to develop a device which can push insulin across the skin. And this was a tough problem. Nobody had figured that out. And when I started, we did not know whether we can do it. But you know, in, in academic research, that's, that's a perfectly acceptable outcome that we just pursue uh, ideas for, for knowledge. And uh, through a lot of work, we did figure it out. We were able to deliver insulin uh, across the skin in a patch. And then um, my advisor, we were talking, so what do we do next? And said, you know, how about we try to actually push it to the clinic? And one way to do that is to uh, translate it into a startup company, which can, which can gather resources to make this happen. And uh, a startup was, uh, uh, spun off out of that research. We started pursuing that research and I actually worked uh, in that startup for a year and a half and that was a transformative experience for me. Uh, the idea as to, you know, you can uh, develop these bright, big, bold ideas and suddenly flip a switch 
and start thinking about practicality, scalability, cost, those issues. And the experience that I got from that has become part of my DNA all along. So ever since I became a professor myself, that's how we approach the problem. We want to pursue ideas which don't currently have a solution and essentially let all our knowledge, all our uh, uh, hard work uh, lose on the problem to find a tangible solution and then implement that in a uh, uh, sort of a usable uh, technology that can be someday used by patients. And I think that's a real, uh, not only a benefit to the society, but also great educational tool for the students because they can get the experience as to how to think about the uh, sort of the scientifically challenging, exciting ideas as well as the practical aspects of it. Yeah, so I think, yeah, so I think that's, that's very important. So that message which you gave, right, you know, really converting that academic research into really making it the, I won't say commercial uh, of the product, but something which will impact the society. That's, so drug delivery has been your forte as I understand. So, so going back to my first question, um, again, Samir, and I, I, I know I don't want to embarrass you further, but having a National Academy of Engineers, Medical and Inventors, like, are you one in million, one in, how would you like to rate it there? How many people do that? I mean, it's definitely not obvious, right? That anybody can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, you know, about 20 to 25 people uh, all over the world who are in that category. So I'm certainly not the only person, uh, but it is very rare uh, for people to be a member of these three academies. Uh, but, you know, really, Sandeep, I mean, really it comes down to is picking a field where you want to make an impact. And right. yeah. driving to make an impact, and this is really the outcome of this. Yeah. And the impact is made by not only one person, but really a team. It's and a it's team. Really a team that has brought yeah. this. No, I mean uh, the reason I said is that you know it's um, even if twenty twenty five in the whole world itself is something which why what I want to inspire people from your credentials some it is to that you know it's doable it's something which you know and and I, that goes to my next question that you and me come from the same background let's say from a small town i come from um, you know from Vidarbha, you come from solapur so we we were taught and you you personally themselves like you moved to UD city and then from there to mit or ict i would say so how will you relate to the journey you have taken so far i'm going back to what how you how conducive your was your environment when you were growing up from compared to that what it is here and what still not deterred you from not pursuing your ambitions so what what were your basic i would say tenets you thought you learned when you were young back in india and then that's where what you thought helped you uh, improve here and grow here in this country that's a great question, Sandeep. Uh, you know, I think um, there are a few traits which I think have been uh, largely responsible for the journey. One is to be very curious all the time. Uh, curious of the surroundings, curious about the problem that we are facing. And if we look at all the common threads between uh, the experience in high school, the experience at ICT, the experience at MIT, and experience at Harvard, there are very few common things. One of them is curiosity, because that, that was important then, and that is important now. Second is uh, persistence, uh, that success doesn't come easily. Uh, you have to work hard to do, do well in the exams back in, in the high school. And we had to work hard today to realize the, the problems to the uh, to, to, to realize the solution to the problem that we're asked a question that we're asking. Um, one also key attribute is being adaptable. You don't always know what questions you will face and what opportunities will come your way. I mean, honestly, you know, when uh, when I joined. UDCT, ICT, I did not know what chemical engineering was, but I knew that it's a good place and being there will open up new opportunities and it did. Same thing with MIT. When I started working uh, 
in the medicine area, I did not know what a chemical engineer can do in medicine, because at that time, it was still dominated by biologists and medical doctors. But I, I knew that deep down, if I'm surrounding myself with good people, good advisors, good colleagues, something good will happen. So being adaptable, and taking a close look at the opportunities around you and constantly innovate and improve, improvise yourself, I think is the key. Um, the journey has sort of you know, brought one, uh, I think, key uh, aspect to my thinking, which is humility, because you cannot predict what you will become. And you can learn a lot being just you know, humble, and listen to people who have something interesting to offer and work with people. And you know, if you ask uh, me as a high school student, would I have ever expected to be someday a professor doing this and that? I mean, it's hard to imagine. So that has brought a sense of humility because I could say, well, I don't know what I will be doing 20 years from now. And that sense of humility, I think, is very important in continuing to making uh, good progress. And one final thing I would say is that surrounding yourself with uh, great people, not only professionally great, but uh, great human beings. And that has been one common thread in everything that I've experienced. Had some amazing high school teachers who told me that I should go to UDCT for chemical engineering, even if I don't know what that is. And I had so much faith in them that I just followed them. I had the same faith in uh, my teachers at UDCT who pointed me in the right direction. My advisor at MIT pointed me in the right direction. And now, you know, uh, people around me, including my students. Uh, so that's one thing I have learned that you know, surrounding yourself with absolutely the best people, especially great human beings, is, is essential to become successful. I think, yeah, that you summed it up well, and I just made a note of it, and I just captioned it like CAP, you know, curiosity, adaptiveness, and perseverance. I would say these are the three traits I would like to, you know, um, have the next generation to at least take an inspiration from you. And most important, I have seen it, I have experienced it, Samir, you are a very humble person, and you, your humility speaks itself volumes when we speak to each other, or uh, I think that's a great trait you mentioned, and I have also experienced the same, you know being with people whom you just don't know uh, you know so um, what they can give you is, is a great humility um, uh, experience i had and i think that's that's something really really inspirational message from you so uh, i mean a little bit i'll just loosen up now just uh, focusing on some of your other passions Samir. so what what other passions you have and i see you have a good dog which you uh, which probably is a member of your family and you you also have a lot of uh, artistic trade as well so tell us more about it i mean is it something just you do it when you get and come out of your academics <laughs> as a relaxation stress buster <laughs> uh, a little bit of everything yeah i think you know i've always been very curious about things outside uh you know uh, research and academics in general um, a lot of that comes from my family uh, my uh, immediate family. Uh, my mother, she used, she used to play sitar very well. My sister does. A lot of people in my extended family are artists. So I always been surrounded by lots of artists and I, you know, have taken inspiration from them. So um, I uh, took it upon myself to spend some time painting when I was still a graduate student and I maintained some of that. Um, and you know, honestly, it has become a little more difficult now to do that up than it used to. Uh, but whenever I can, I do like to, uh, you know, indulge a bit into that. Uh, at minimum, I appreciate art and ideally yeah. do some painting. Um, the dog, uh, as you uh, mentioned, uh, that has changed in our life. Uh, so uh, we got a dog. Uh, last year and one of the wonderful things that a dog did was basically uh forced us to be outside almost every day <laughs> uh, and you know so uh i was just you know uh, talking to uh friends about it this morning that uh our dog loves to be outside you know every day no matter what the season is 
And you know, when I remember how we, especially maybe me looking at the seasons, and we have different views of cold and hot weather and the dog just wants to be outside. <laughs> Loud. Play. Yeah. Every day, no matter what. If there's the snow, he will just run in the snow. If it is hot, he'll just run the rock. If there's water, yeah. he'll get water. And you know, uh, in addition to like a very tangible benefit of being outside in nature every day, you know, I think that also has brought a very uh, sort of almost like a spiritual <laughs> message. Yeah. Right? Uh, you yeah. will appreciate things around you uh, and sort of, you know, take some time to be outside in nature and enjoy nature. And that's been uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, I like to listen to music. Uh, so do that whenever yeah. I can. So, I mean, the reason I ask you is, you know, in our corporate environments, uh, Samir, where I belong to, it's always about, oh, you need to have a work-life balance, right? And we always are uh, always hammered about, oh, don't stress you too much, you know, and then have some passion or hobby. But as an academician, also, I felt, you know, uh, or somebody who is deep involved into research and all, what do you do for your other, other life is what I was more curious about, to keep yourself sane in all this rat race, right? So that's that's was one of the reasons of the questions. Now, um, going to the next question, Samir, uh, uh, and I, I want to basically now talk about the field you are in, right? And a little bit more on that. Uh, what opportunities you see for the youngsters and what, what will be your um, you know uh, vision, what you see? I mean, in, in our corporate world, we call it Industry 4.0, where we are in IT and with 5G, we see that the whole world is going to change in the next decade or a century. And how we think, how we see, how we do the business, everything is going to change the way internet changed the world. So changes you see in the field of drug delivery and what are the opportunities for our children to pursue that passion, if you may say so. I mean. Uh, not necessarily in Harvard's or the MIT's of the world, but in general, what should people, the uh, students, be focusing on? Sure. Uh, the opportunities are really amazing, Sandeep. Uh, the, the world of medicine is changing as we speak. The world of therapeutics is changing as we speak. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you go back uh, 20, 25 years ago, the medicine that we were thinking about where a very different nature. Uh, for example, if you think about cancer, uh, the goal was to just deliver a, a toxic agent that can kill cancer cells. Or if there is any other you know, disease, basically you design some small pill that can that can temporarily fix uh, the, uh, the issue, may not really get rid of the disease. But as we are learning, we being with the field, learning more and more about the human body, we are able to go deeper and deeper into biology and make transformative changes. And that has come in various forms. Uh, in one way, uh, we are looking at gene editing, right? So the areas where you can go and modify the DNA of the cell in a, in a, in a way that can completely change the outcome of the disease in that patient. Uh, gene therapy, where you go in and essentially replace the gene with a new gene. So that is really like curing the disease. So that's like a different level of treatment. Yeah. On the cell side, uh, there are several therapies where people are using cells as therapeutics. And this has become immunotherapy. And the thought there is that human cells are in a far better position to treat a disease than any particular chemical that we can synthesize. So why not empower them? Why not use them to treat the disease? And some of the immunotherapies which are coming out are realizing that potential. So moving forward, I see a, a tremendous opportunity to use biomimetic, bio-inspired, bio-design system, where we are not going to think about medicine as something that just simply masks the symptoms, but something that goes in and fundamentally leverages the rest of the body to come up with a significant treatment, if not cure. And we are just at the beginning of that process. So the opportunities I see uh, for the next generation are really to uh, 
think about ways to learn about the biological principles and reduce them into a synthetic system that can become a therapeutic. And uh, that, I think, you know, is, uh, I, I wouldn't say that is only a biological problem. If anything, I think that's an engineering problem. I think the next generation of therapies and treatments are going to be led by engineers because uh, one of the key principles of engineering where you learn about a system, break it into pieces and rebuild a, a tool. Uh, that is the way the next generation of therapeutics are going to be designed. And I think it is a tremendously exciting time for uh, the young generation to be in this. Thank you. That, that is really informative, uh, something which uh, I wanted to know from you, Samir. And uh, so, uh, so on this platform where I, um, I really, again, welcome you. As you know, you are, the, uh, you are in one of the few people in the first book which we published. Uh, and as you know, um, uh, Mr. Anand Ganu, who is the president of um, um, this Gharjaya Marathi Global, um, is is basically um, running this whole um, show. I would say he has done a tremendous job of we Marathi people all around the world. Now we are uh, we are now uh, having members from twenty three different countries, and we are growing as we speak. Every day we have our Innovation Academy, who is conducting webinars every week, where we have now connected to a lot of engineering colleges in India, uh, in Maharashtra, where. You know, um, people we want uh, to get encouraged and uh, by the success stories of people like you who have done some great work in their field, and I'm sure this will be another inspiring video that we would like to uh, you know them to watch for. But uh, some message from you about the work we are doing so far. Whatever you heard about Gharja Marathi Global Summit. It is truly. Amazing, Sandeep. I mean, I do recall the first time that Anand contacted me many years ago. And at that time, it was in the early phases of this initiative, Grazi Marathi. And to see to what an amazing point this has come to, it is truly incredible. What I'm really impressed about is this initiative to reach out to people and increase awareness among the, especially among the younger generation, about the success stories uh, of people before then that can provide some maybe interesting insight, maybe anecdotes, and not only I think learn from successes, but also failures, right? Because we can learn from any, opp yeah. any, any opportunity. And I'm deeply grateful to Anand and you for starting this initiative and it to this point and more power to you and amazed to see that it has reached so many different countries so many different people and um, i'm sure that in coming generations we look back and ask about uh, how did people become aware of uh, people all over the world doing well who came from this background and they will look to you uh, for bringing us to this point if not already and uh, Kudos to you. This is truly amazing. Thank you. I mean, uh, it's people like you who make it more um, successful. I think what Anand's vision was to basically, you know, bring uh, bring forward all these stories. And in fact, uh, what you and me are also proud of is uh, Dr. Mashelkar has blessed us many times over for this platform. He was there on 3rd of August where we had our third anniversary of uh, uh, starting of Garza Marathi. So, uh, people like you and all the great people who are associated with this moment makes it good. And uh, we we feel immensely proud to be associated with people like you. So thank you once again, Samir, and uh, appreciate all you said today. And I'm sure it will be a lot of inspiration for people and uh, many more. And I'm pretty sure we'll talk to you again one more time, maybe on a bigger platform where that might be a webinar, because I'm pretty sure people would like to have an interactive session which is what we intend to plan for the next phase. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.